As the ability of the Lost Plagas was not fully known concerning how it could impact the human meat suit, the only logical conclusion to any future with this parasite and its gene editing abilities was to begin to run experimentations on villagers and travelers that just happened by. At the beginning, the people who were just infected by breathing in the long dormant parasitic spores would be controlled by a more dominant strain of Lost Plagas, but their usefulness was very limited. Possessing really only the beneficial trait of being controlled, they would conduct minor attacks on others, but with any amount of training or ability to counter these attacks, it was really only about as useful as a regular civilian attacking one another. And even to that point, the movement was sluggish, their bodies were not as conducive to military missions, and ultimately, this would just highlight the potential this parasite had concerning mind control, but little else. As Sadler, the biggest nerd imaginable, would hire on researchers to further the study of this parasite, his goals would begin to shift, as it always tends to do, towards world domination. By understanding this parasite and that it had the ability to control anyone that it came into contact with, thus allowing him to control the person who was infected, the plan began to center around the idea of mind-altering the world leaders, and more specifically, the President of the United States. Because let's be real here, if you control the United States, you control the world. USA, baby! By hiring Krauser to retrieve Ashley, the President's daughter, she would be infected with the parasite as the plan was to have her rescued and then return to her father, where she would go on to infect him, thus completing a large portion portion of their overall, I guess, uh, vision board, resulting in the other world leaders being infected over time and the eventual collapse of society under one ruler, which would be Sadler. Of course, what Sadler couldn't grasp is that the mind-altering parasite that could inspire horrific anatomical changes, you don't really control something like that. You get controlled by something like that. And because of this, his goal would go from just a generalized outline to a full-blown religion as it tends to do with humanity. To thwart this, well, really just to save Ashley as he ultimately ended up thwarting the end of the world, Leon would be dispatched stumbling across experimentations and slightly unethical testing that was taking place in this backwater village in Spain. As he would traverse the area, his mission would change from just rescuing Ashley, because really, at any point after finding Ashley, he could have just walked off into the woods with her and then kind of just kept walking. It became increasingly obvious it would be imperative that they would need to remove the parasite from their bodies, otherwise Sadler's plan would come to fruition. After moving into the castle, the extent of this parasitic experimentation would be laid bare. Deep within the basement, like an absolute neat, would be a creature known as the Garador, or Garador, whatever. Blinded, angry, and having not showered in many months, he would be your average Reddit mod with the same personality to boot. But what exactly were the structural changes to the body, and how were they achieved through hormonal alterations? Let's discuss that in today's episode over the Garador, which apparently is how you pronounce it. But first, this episode is sponsored by Incogni. Did you know your data on the internet is probably pretty much everywhere right now? It's currently being bought and sold for somebody else's personal gain. You know that guy that always calls you at like 6.49 p.m. right when you sat down for dinner offering you nonsense that you don't need? Yeah, that's because they bought your information from somewhere else when your personal info was leaked. Classic. Things like your full name, your email address, home address, gender, phone number, relative, social security number, all of that. Well, if you're ready to put a stop to that, then by using today's sponsor, because you do have the right to request your personal data be deleted from their servers, you can stop all of these annoyances. Do it alone would probably take months or years to track them down, but by heading to incogni.com forward slash Roanoke and using code Roanoke, you can get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. You might not think it's already happened to you. It has. For real, let's say that you subscribed to like a newsletter or you were looking up some medical cases like I do. You start seeing ads and promotions because of that medical case, or you start receiving a lot of spam from unknown senders because of the newsletter. That's your cue to get your data taken off of their servers. Incogni works to do this and they send you updated reports on their progress as they pull your information from data brokers. So again, if that sounds like uh, that's going to be a good thing for you, then going to incognito.com forward slash Roanoke and using code Roanoke, you can get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan, or you can just click the link below. All right, let's get back to it. Walking into the castle, you need to understand what this area's original purpose was for. Initially, for generations that came after, this castle was built as a fortress in order to contain Las Plagas from escaping. Relegated to the passages below the castle, the first plan was to corrupt the nobility of the this castle. Being one of the more weaker parts of the bloodline that the family had really ever had or existed within this area, Ramon Salazar would be easily swayed by Sadler, ultimately convincing him to allow, like, the revival of the Las Plagas under his command as he was promised power for it. Completely forsaking his family's mission that they had conducted for hundreds of years, a mining operation would bring back Las Plagas, but it was desiccated, not able to be revived in its multicellular form. Because of this, 
it would at first appear like this was a lost cause. By opening up the passageways though into the caves and sending in villagers, by natural interaction oxygen levels would need to be raised in the environment and movement would eventually stir up a spore form of Las Plagas. As these spores entered through the nasal passages, moving into the trachea and then settling in the alveolar sacs of the lungs, it would appear that unfortunately the human innate immune system could do very little to prevent this infection. Which fun fact! Did you know that you had white blood cells patrolling your lungs at all times? Every day we take in thousands of spores, actually between 1 and 10 per breath. Because of the natural environment of your lungs being warm, moist, and dark, this is the perfect breeding ground for mold spores. However, white blood cells are constantly moving around in your lungs, searching for these foreign bodies and engulfing them. Without our immune system, we would meet our ends by suffocation as the mold would quickly grow wildly out of control, choking us out. Absolutely insane to think how our immune system not only just handles this, but it does so effectively our entire lives without, like, failing ever. Unless you catch, like, HIV, in which case, yeah, then it, then it kind of fails. Anyhow, back to the parasite. As the infection would begin, it became clear that the villagers who were mining would at first have an immune response like anyone else. Their white blood cells were not able though to engulf and destroy the parasite like it would with the mold, likely due to the fact that the parasite was bigger and also had a tougher exterior armoring that is seen in the multicellular version. Because of this, the parasite would grow and be thoroughly reborn, much to the delight of Sadler. One of the interesting things that can be seen throughout any infection form is seemingly the place of the parasite inspires massive changes downstream. For the standard Ganado, which uh, is just your average person who was infected by the parasite, either by natural means of breathing it in or through human intervention, such as injecting the parasite into your neck, this parasite appears to settle into the chest cavity of a person near the heart and lungs. Knowing that the parasite is oxygen dependent, as when it was in the mines with lower levels of oxygen, left it almost extinct. This is an integral clue and an integral place for it to exist for its own survival. By placing itself near the heart and lungs, it would have access to the pulmonary vein specifically. By tapping into this area, it could fuse with its own siphon, so to speak, into the vein to retrieve oxygen-rich blood. Now remember, arteries go away from the heart and are usually oxygenated, and veins go towards the heart and are usually deoxygenated. But the interesting thing about the pulmonary vein is it's actually coming from the lungs towards the heart, so it's oxygenated, whereas the pulmonary artery is going towards the lungs because it's deoxygenated. Anywho, this may be why it also inspires such changes to others, which we will see soon. From here, the tendrils, which can completely destroy the cervical spine, as well as the skull, can come out at night in order to attack others. However, this is just the standard placement that does not appear to be really putting selective pressure on the parasite. In the experimentation process, it is seen quite readily that placement of the parasite and where it specifically bonds to is very important. Take El Gigante, and I pronounce it like that because it makes everyone upset. The placement of the parasite would be just around the cervical area of the spine, which is the neck, and this had quite an impact on the size of the creature. Standing at just under the height of a barn, it would be basically putting this thing at around 20 to 25 feet tall, or 7 to 8 meters tall. Because of the location being specifically in the neck of this creature, it would appear to me oxygen through the carotid artery would be much more limited in terms of volume coming through. This would seemingly inspire changes in the body that we will actually see kind of in the Garador. But the question remains, why are these changes present? To understand that, we must first take a look at the Garador's physiology, as this will help to explain why perhaps these differences even exist in the first place. Ah shit, here we go again. Starting with the feet of the Garador, we see that it's actually just your average homegrown feet. Don't get too excited over there. However, we can see at the ankle, with the width that it is, even with boots on, it has increased, indicating that the growth all over the body is intentional and has happened through a steady release of hormones, which we will discuss when we get to the neurology. Moving up to the legs, we see the muscle mass has also increased in this area, and an armor plating has been added to protect the front of the shins. The reasoning here is quite clear. As we all know, the Garador has been blinded, making it really easy for him to run into the corner of a coffee table and and absolutely destroy his shins. This is actually a pretty apropos solution to my own apparent inability to sense a freaking coffee table near me about three minutes ago. Moving up further the legs to the pelvic region, essentially this guy can squat. But interestingly, as we move up to the abdomen, we can begin to see what has happened to the body, indicating pronounced hypertrophy. There is evidence of wounding on some of the Garador's abdomens, but again, this is probably from their own claws, but the abdominal region has pronounced musculature, which will be the theme as we move up to the thoracic region. At one point, possessing clothing, the shirt has either been torn due to the armaments, or it has been basically just torn because it's gotten so big. But then when we get to the shoulders and arms, we can see swole goals is in full effect. I too am trying to get this muscular. The shoulders being the connection point to the body, obviously, where the arms, you know, connect to the chest. 
but it has increased in connective tissue to allow for the Gyarados to swing around its large claws that it has with the muscles stretching and tearing the skin, or at least the skin is just barely keeping up with the underlying growth. Moving down the arms, large metallic connective points have been attached to the arms, allowing for the hands to curl around an apparatus built specifically to create these massive claws that then can be powerfully swung, taking out anything near it. Moving up to the head, we see a face only a mother could love at this point. It is unknown if the person has any hair left on their head, but it appears to be pretty standard after experimentations are conducted for everyone to lose their hair. Which brings in this episode sponsored by Keep. Nah, it's not sponsored by Keeps. But the mouth is covered up by bars to prevent biting, and the eyes have been sewn shut to prevent the Garador from actually seeing what it's attempting to attack. The helmet has been affixed and chained to the body to basically prevent it from removing it itself. Moving around to the back of the creature, again, the latissimus muscles are absolutely massive, as well as the posterior deltoid area and trapezius muscle. But the most obvious point of focus is Las Plagas sprouting from its back. Back. A slit sits just between the shoulders, indicating that this particular parasite was planted in the thoracic spine, not the cervical spine, which again, is rather interesting as it highlights why this particular person didn't end up like a Ganado or an El Gigante. Really, instead, it's just sort of like a median creature. I believe it has to do with oxygen and the ability to acquire nutrients. In those who have the parasite in their chest specifically, this allows for the parasite to acquire all the nutrients it needs and dominate the body really quickly. And those that have the parasite in their cervical area, there is less access to oxygen and nutrients. And because of this, the parasite is forced to take a larger proportion of the oxygen, which in turn leads to massive brain damage as less oxygen is getting to a human's brain meat, which renders El Gigante more animalistic as its frontal lobe has been deprived of oxygen as they fall back on instinctual behaviors rather than higher thought. However, with the Garador, it is the middle ground. Because the Garador and the Parasite is grafted into the thoracic area of the body, or at least on the back, the access to the oxygen would be greater than if it was just in the neck, but less than if it was right next to the pulmonary vein. As a result of this, it is forced to alter the host in several different ways in order to help sustain its own life, which the level of growth the body seems to support, also seems to support this theory. The further away from central mass and the ability to get oxygen, the more prone the Parasite is to altering the hormones of an animal that it is in, as well as it may even just straight exit the body in order to breathe. As the Garador has the parasite on its back, it would clearly be interfacing with the spinal cord and following it up to the brain with its tendrils in order to manipulate the organism. By entering through the area where the brainstem usually enters the skull, the foramen magnum, it would first come into contact with the lower areas of the brain. These areas contain critically sensitive structures that are used to coordinate several different autonomic functions of the body. What is an autonomic function, I can hear you asking? Essentially, these are functions your body has inspired by the peripheral nervous system, which can either be associated with the sympathetic pathway, which involves activation of the nervous system, like, uh, here's a way to remember it. I am sympathetic towards your almonds being activated. You'll remember that forever now. Or the parasympathetic system, which has a calming effect on your nervous system. So things like breathing that are automated, except for right now, because, uh, I mentioned it, and we're all manually breathing, but don't feel too bad. I had to manually breathe twice, one when I wrote this and one when I said it, so uh, it's totally worth it. Anyhow, the endocrine system concerning my line of thinking would be the target of Las Plagas. By rustling the jimmies of specifically the pituitary gland through things like physical pressure or even by Las Plagas altering the behavior of the gland entirely through gene manipulation, which as we all know, Las Plagas definitely appears to be able to do, the body would immediately begin having human growth hormone pumped into it as well as many other hormones. By a signal being sent out by the ultra pituitary gland, this would also signal to the testes of the Garador to increase testosterone production, and this would have a two fold effect. First, human growth hormone would obviously increase muscle mass and bone density, as well as triggering a second puberty of sorts within the Garador, making him grow in height by reactivation of the pyphocele plates, or the growth plates of the long bones. Second, because of the increased growth, this would trigger the body to increase the amount of red blood cells in the body in order to now fuel the new muscle mass that has begun to build up on the frame. This is why bodybuilders, for instance, who do steroids always seem like they're out of breath. Now, there is a hormonal trigger that has been cited, but you also need to realize building muscle that quickly will put a strain on your circulatory system as your body would rapidly begin building red blood cells in order to deal with this new strain of extra muscle. This would also increase or at least cause more pressure on the lungs to take in more oxygen, which again, breathlessness. Las Plagas would bank on this as new vascularity would begin to show up as well. With the muscle increasing, the oxygen saturation of the body maintaining, there is really going to be more circulatory blood vessels present, and the body would need to create these new blood vessels to properly saturate the tissue with 
the oxygen necessary. As a result, because of this growth, the Las Plagas has inspired in the body, it is able to tap into these new blood vessels and glean oxygen from them more effectively than just the normal amount of red blood cells that were in the normal amount of blood vessels. To me, it appears the worse the oxygen saturation in an area, the more aggressive Las Plagas has to be to the alterations of the body. With El Gigante, the reason he is so large is because this area would still not have much oxygen in it even after altering the body through endocrine system manipulation. Instead, it would keep altering until finally the person becomes so large that their system is just completely distorted and the head is then pushed forward and even though it was attached to the neck at one point, it now appears to be on the back as enough blood vessels have fueled it and it grows in size as well, which is why it was a larger Las Plagas because it is also dealing with growth hormone. With Garador specifically, this same process was undertaken, which is absolutely fascinating as Las Plagas only had to alter the body somewhat in order to achieve the oxygen saturation it needed with new vessels running towards it. So what it appears to me to be is like the parasite is just being a parasite. It inspires changes to the endocrine system alterations to grow the body to properly fuel itself. But again, this has downstream effects on the functionality of the body as well as behavior. Since we were talking about testicles earlier, this can help to explain the behavior. That's right, emotions are stored in the ball. As the pituitary gland would be kicking it into maximum overdrive through Las Plagas manipulation, this in turn would cause testosterone levels to rise dramatically in the Gyarado. Think of it as like a roid rage, but 10 times as worse because it's coupled with cerebral damage specifically to the frontal lobe being the point of interest which is associated with emotional control. Plus there is no reason to think that the amygdala, which is where anger and fear come from, is not affected by the same manipulation causing the Garador to be in a constant state of rage. This is actually quite an issue for those conducting the experiments. Due to the blind rage the Garador would engage in, this would result in it absolutely stacking bodies and just attacking anything around it. This clearly would cause the experiment to be labeled a failure from the simple fact that that while they were on the right track as far as attempting to create a super soldier of sorts who was stronger than normal, it could not be directed towards any particular goal as it would not listen. As a result, the ones that were created were chained up and had their eyes sewn shut so they wouldn't just actively attack anything near it. However, this was only a temporary solution. As it is unknown how long they were blinded for, the human brain has a tendency to adapt to circumstances involving our senses. By rendering the Garador blind, all it did was make its hearing better. This is noted in blind people all the time actually as a natural adaptation to lost senses. With this, the Garador is strong enough to break chains and can hear a field mouse fart a mile away. As a sound is made by anyone in the area, it would appear as though much like how other Las Plagas drive humans to like not attack one another who are already infected, the Garador can differentiate between fully turned and those only recently infected that are still in control of their own bodies, that being Leon. Because of this, they will walk past those who are fully infected, but this does not completely save them. Because the Garador's own smooth brain comes into play, this creates a bit of an issue. With this much testosterone coursing through them, there is still some semblance of humanity in each one of the infected, even if they are like fully infected. They will still control their own bodies during downtime or during times of like extreme emotional unrest they might be able to come to for a minute. When getting near Leon, it will completely spaz out and start swinging around its blades. Again, blinded, so it isn't 100% sure who it's hitting, which typically turns out to be other infected that just give in way. Eventually, the Las Plagas will regain control of the body and slow it down to attack before once again losing control of the body as the person goes into a fit of rage. There's really only one way to take these things out. Now, two if you have enough money. Either way, you can just like you can possibly just straight up RPG the thing in the face, which defeats it seeing as it's enough energetic concussive force being distributed through its body, or imparted into it at least, to blow it apart and the Las Plagas is then decimated. The other option is to attempt to take it out with the Las Plagas on its back. With it running forward, again, you have two possibilities. The first one is uh, you get got. If Leon isn't feeling as spry as usual, the Garador will punch its claws through his face, shredding the underside of Leon's brain and his brainstem. So this is pretty much a lights on, lights off scenario, and you wouldn't even feel that. You'd just be gone. He will then stab you through the chest, which is kind of insult to injury. And the other option is, uh, if you're really not feeling good, it'll just straight up decapitate you. You may be alive for a few seconds when you're just a head rolling around, but you would be in total shock. Uh, they did an experiment with a guillotine to see if somebody could like blink and he was alive for like, I think it was like 12 to 15 seconds, they say 30 seconds, but we still don't really know. 
However, that's not how we do it around here, partner. By tricking the Garador, because again, it's not very smart, it's just very angry, you can get it to accidentally get its claws stuck in a wall, completely exposing Las Plagas on its back. The reasoning it's even there in the first place is that it may have in fact needed more oxygen and was actually breaching the skin in order to do so, sort of like what it does with El Gigante. Upon hitting enough shots, Las Plagas has become so entrenched in the nervous system and the signaling that it's conducting where it, therein, I suppose, it's going to disrupt it significantly enough the heart stops, which also is seemingly affected, which again leads to the end of the Garador. Ultimately, the Garador is an attempt at a super soldier through experimentation with the placement of Las Plagas. We also see the same experimentation with like Iron Maidens or Regenerators, but they have several and even that puts like even more pressure on their circulatory system, which causes them to be able to heal super fast. But with specifically this one, it seems that the further away the Las Plagas is from oxygenated sources, or again, multiple are added, this will have impacts on the size of the body and healing factors. With this person in particular, it made them larger and more aggressive, but due to other factors, this just makes them dangerous, but the cost-benefit analysis of it was that it was far too skewed, causing them to really serve no purpose beyond just your standard cannon fodder. Well, anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leave a like would be awesome of you, and subscribe is a great way to stay up to date when I post, because we are getting near 1 million subs. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, Roanoke Tales link, and merch links in the description if you want to help out the channel. But speaking of patrons, though, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death's Dancer. Thank you, my man. I'd also like to thank our scientist, Chad, the enjoyer of scientific explanations, being read horror movies, Dakota 23, Josh Blanchard, Lucian Dragon, Metric System, The Last Final Girl on the Left, and Trash Pen and Trench Coat. And the rest of my patrons, I appreciate you guys as well. Your support is awesome, and it's definitely appreciated. So, uh, big thing, I'm going to stop streaming on Roanoke Gaming because it is absolutely killing my channel's ability to reach other things. Like, I always figure this out, like, every year, but then I try it again. I'm like, no, oh, surely... <laughs> Surely things will be different this time. I'm uh, I'm kind of the same way with women. Anyways, so uh, Roanoke Games on Twitch and Roanoke Games on YouTube. That's where these streams are going to be from now on. I'm going to leave my channel alone as far as just uploading you know, videos here, not uploading live streams. So anyways, that's going to do for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all on the next one.